Hey calculus class, today we are going to be evaluating limits algebraically. So you need to be thinking about algebra and using some algebra skills that you may need to go back and review from Algebra 3-4 or Math and L. So what we currently already know is that over the past few days we've learned four methods to evaluate the limits. What are they? So take a minute and see if you can jot down the four that we've talked about. You should have said graphs, tables, limit laws, and direct substitution. Now there is a fifth one. What is it? Algebra. And this is the one that you're going to probably use the most. So from day two, when we were doing graphs and tables, we used a table and a graph and looked from the left and the right to see what value uh, the limit approached. Now, if we wanted to use direct substitution, which means, oh, sorry, we did find that it was one half. Now, if we use direct substitution, we are going to go ahead and plug in one where X is. When that happens, you will see that we're going to get zero over zero. Well, what is zero over zero? Is it one, zero, or undefined? Which one do you think it is? Well, if you're unsure, well, you would agree with the rest of the math world. <laughs> we call this an indeterminate form. And every time you get something like zero over zero, this tells you you have to do some type of algebra to this limit to get the one half that we know is the correct answer. So an indeterminate form is an expression that may or may not exist. Basically, no one's agreed what the value is, so we say that it's indeterminate. The ones that you're going to see the most are zero over zero and infinity over infinity. Some other ones that you're going to see um, not for another few more weeks are zero times infinity, infinity minus infinity, zero to the zero power, infinity to the zero power, or one to the infinite power. All right, so now let's go ahead and do the algebra to this limit, which we know the answer is one half. So your first step is to determine if you have an indeterminate form by using direct substitution which we have already done. Well, when you plug in one, we get zero over zero. So now we're going to use algebra to simplify the function. So what is some algebraic step that I can do to this function? If you've said factor the difference of two squares at the bottom, good job. So I'm gonna factor the x squared minus x. And when I do so, you'll notice that we can cancel the x minus ones. So bye bye x minus ones, and I am left with the limit as x approaches one of one over x plus one. Notice that as I'm simplifying, I bring the limit notation with me every single time. Like I said before, you do not drop the limit notation until after you have plugged in the number. Now step three, is now we can go ahead and use direct substitution to evaluate the limit. If you get another indeterminate form, then you must continue using algebra until you don't get an indeterminate form anymore. So I'm gonna go ahead and plug in one for x. When I do so, we see we get the one half, which we already knew was the correct answer. All right, your turn. Go ahead and pause the video and see if you can do the problem one and problem two by yourself. Welcome back. So how'd it go? <laughs> Let's see if you did these correctly. On the first one, the algebra you should have noticed is some factoring. So on the top, you can factor out an X and on the bottom, you can factor out that trinomial. So after factoring, you would get the following and you'll notice that the x minus fours should cancel. Bye-bye. We are left with 
x over x plus 1. Now I'm going to go ahead and plug in 4 to see if I get an indeterminate form. And I get 4 over 5. So there's my answer. Now, the bottom. How did we do on that one? The algebra, if you noticed, is that we'd have to expand out the 2 plus h cubed. Now, you can either do that by multiplying it out multiple times or using Pascal's triangle. Whichever way you chose, you would have gotten the following. And after some simplifying and combining like terms, so the 8's go away, and I can factor out an h. So the 8's disappeared, factor out an h on the top. Notice, hello, there is an h on the top and the bottom. That can be canceled. Bye-bye. And I'm left with 12 plus 6h plus h squared. Now I can go ahead and plug in 0. When I do so, I get 12. I hope you were able to do this on your own. If not, please make sure you ask questions on Edmodo or in class. All right, here is another one for you to try. So go ahead and if you have not done so already, pause the video and try problem number three. All right, so with this one, what type of algebra did you use? Well, we have a square root here. So when we see a square root, this should tell you to rationalize. However, you guys are probably used to rationalizing the denominator. Actually, we're going to rationalize the numerator this time, which is totally fine. So in order to rationalize, you have to multiply the top and the bottom by the conjugate. So the conjugate is changing the sign to the opposite that separates the two terms. So after multiplying the top and bottom by the conjugate, you can go ahead and distribute through. Basically, you have a difference of two squares. After doing so, you should get the following. The middle terms cancel, and the square root also cancels. Now I'm going to go ahead and simplify. The ones go away. Notice that I left the h out. There is a reason for that, because it will disappear eventually. So instead of having to refactor it out, I'm not even going to distribute it through. So the ones cancel. And look, there we go. The h's are now going to disappear. And I'm left with 1 over the square root of 1 plus h plus 1. Now I can plug in 0. And after simplifying, I get 1 half. Absolute value. Hmm. The biggest thing with absolute value that students always, always forget is that absolute value is a piecewise function. Don't forget that when every time you see this, you should stop off to the side of your paper. You need to rewrite the absolute value as a piecewise function. So let's see how many of us remember how to do that. So you first ask yourself, all right, we got x minus 2. What x value makes this inside 0? You should say 2, which is correct. So at x equals 2, that means that's where my pieces break. And with absolute value, we have a positive side and a negative sign. So the stuff that's inside the absolute value will be positive every time it's greater than 2. Or equal to 2, that gives you the 0. So you can just tack on the or equal at the positive. Doesn't really matter. Now, the stuff inside will become negative when x is less than 2. So you have the positive side and the negative side. Now, we can rewrite our limit as a left-handed limit and a right-handed limit. So what piece am I going to use for the left side? So that means what x values are to the left of 2, x values less than 2. So that means for the left-handed side, I'm going to use this piece of the function 
to evaluate the limit. So I'm going to rewrite this as the following. Now I can go ahead and distribute the negative or plug in the two, however you want to do it, and you get zero. All right. Okay, now let's go ahead and do the right-handed limit. So I'm going to rewrite the absolute value from the right using the x, the piece that makes it positive, so x minus 2, plug in 2, and I get 0. Since the left and the right are the same value, that means this limit exists and it equals 0. Your turn. All right, go ahead and pause the video and see if you can do this by yourself. Remember, rewrite only the piecewise, the absolute value piece as a piecewise function. All right, so the first thing is to take that absolute value and rewrite it for the positive side and the negative side. Negative three is where the inside is zero. So for the left-handed side, I'm going to use when x is less than negative 3. So I'm going to use this bottom piece to rewrite the left-hand side. So I'm only replacing the absolute value piece with this negative piece. And as you can see, the x plus 3's cancel. And I'm left with a negative 1 over 1, which gives me negative 1. Right-hand side, I'm going to use the positive piece. So I'm going to replace the absolute value piece with x plus 3. The x plus 3's cancel, and I'm left with 1. Now, since the left-hand side is negative 1, the right-hand side is 1, they are not the same, therefore, this limit does not exist. 